So got uh, the company Kangia here today. Uh, they're coming on and they're starting to make some progress uh, in the cannabis industry in Australia. And uh, if you guys wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and kind of just tell me a little bit of background about, you know, who you are, where you came from, the industry you came from, and, and what you guys are currently working on. Sure. Um, no, I'll jump in first, if that's okay with you. Um, so my name is Martin Bryden. I am the commercial director for Kangia. I'm also one of the co-founders of Kangia. Uh, my background is in commercial strategy and growth. Uh, I've worked in both the UK, Europe, and uh, I've been in Australia for the last 10 years. Um, predominantly before this, I was involved in AI technology, and uh, I got into this uh, actually because um, I saw my niece go through uh, chemotherapy when she had leukemia or diagnosed with leukemia when she was two and a half years old. Uh, so my journey into the researching and looking into the space was about eight years ago. Uh, and then effectively about five years ago, we um, started the concept and, and the business really started from there. And Niall, yourself? So my name is Dr. Niall Wheat. I'm a pharmaceutical chemist by training and I'm the science director for Kangia. Um, as well as that, I'm also an academic at the University of Sydney in the pharmacy school. And my particular interests are in drug formulation and drug delivery. Um, I came to Kangia by chance. I've actually completed a master's of business administration degree. And it was during one of the classes that I met the CEO of Kangia. And we saw a lot of value in us coming together. Um, I met uh, Martin a number of years ago at a, uh, I think it was like Canatech conference uh, down in Sydney when, you know, there was all the hype of the medical cannabis industry coming into Australia and all the big guys were kind of down there and trying to do business, but there really wasn't much of a market in Australia to move forward. But it seems like increasingly the industry is starting to get some legs and starting to get a little bit of momentum. Can you tell me, uh, what the current state of the industry is from your point of view in Australia and then and then how you guys are fitting into it. Yeah, sure. Um, as you say, um, sort of that was, I think, the first uh, actual um, event or industry event that that Kangia actually had a presence at. Uh, the market was certainly uh, in its infancy there. Um, in terms of how the industry uh, within Australia and then further wide has grown, um, if we look at from a compliance around the the actual licensing for an example i think we've seen significant uh, improvements um, from the office of drug control and the tga and supporting the industry um, a good example of that would be um, we've been working initially from a, a separate license and permit scheme so that would cover things like cultivation your manufacturing and research licenses fast forwarding to today we're now moving to the single license scheme what we've also seen in terms of the actual industry itself and the growth is um, there is certainly now a lot more collaboration and integration with not just Australian businesses, but but international businesses, and that's throughout the supply chain. So uh, that certainly helps help the industry in Australia grow uh, from from outside support as well. And so do you see that as becoming more of an export market? Well, when the industry or uh, sort of became legalized, if you will, the, the government's idea of pushing the industry was purely to push uh, an export uh, industry, especially from a manufacturing point of view. By default in Australia, our standards are extremely high. Uh, we're one of the few regions globally that treats um, CBD, for example, the cannabinoids, CBD, as a pharmaceutical rather than a herbal. So. By default, the standards we have to hit are pharma grade. And that was the initial push. Of course, um, organically, there was pressure put on the government from its own citizens because um, there has been a demand for, for, for the access to medical cannabis products uh, for longer than the industry has existed, that's for sure. And along with building up that industry and supporting there, what we're starting to see now, see now is the, the there's a bit of a match coming together with regards to access for patients uh, versus just uh, um, an industry that exports all, it, all its products overseas. Um, so, but I would still say, um, of course, due to the simple size of the population in Australia, there will be 
a big export market. We personally see with our clients is especially Australian and New Zealand owned brands that are looking to build and uh, roll out a brand and a portfolio of products is starting in Australia and New Zealand. Um, as that scales up, then obviously pushing those products and, and reaching more of a global market share uh, into other regions, particularly places like Europe. Um, but Southeast Asia, we're starting to see come on board in, in a few key key areas as well. Um, you brought up the kind of transition from the from the uh, you know manufacturing license, um, the cultivation license, these different licensing types to a single license. Can you tell me about that uh, from your point of view, and how if, has that affected you at all? And and is it being rolled? How's it being rolled out? And from yeah, your certainly. Um, I mean, one of the key areas that we saw in the beginning, and it, it's only natural, the the Office of Drug Control, which essentially is uh, the office that issues uh, permits, uh, uh, licenses, etc. Um, initially, we're heavily under-resourced. It was a brand new industry. You wouldn't expect them, the government to throw a major resource behind something that is new and you know ironing out a lot of wrinkles. So there has been a major impact. As, as an example, um, we obtained our manufacturing license over two years ago. Uh, and we're only now getting to the completion stage of our of our cultivation license. So you can imagine, from a commercial standpoint, that's had major impacts on our business. Um, it works differently, for example, in Canada, where it's the you know they build the facility first, then apply for the license. That comes with its own pitfalls and risks. But we've had to be very agile. It's been extremely difficult and complicated because it's not just. Um, I know carry on with business as usual. The way our business model was built was around having the cultivation and the the um, manufacturing license. As such, we've had to be agile, not just from even raising investment, but how our business model runs. Um, so it's it's been certainly tricky. Um, I think the way that they are going now in the single license scheme will address a lot of those problems for businesses because I personally feel uh, from being in the network of the industry that some of the businesses might have stalled or even failed but based on uh, the longevity that it's taken and some of the complications. So moving to the single license um, scheme, um, I believe will allow the businesses to set themselves out, uh, up uh, in a more structured manner to be, actually, to be able to roll that business and model plan out, if you like. Um, some of those complications that you're talking about could you just touch on maybe one or two um yes uh, sure so um as i said they were heavily under resourced so i think when the office of drug control looked at this as an initial industry they were expecting roughly around about 10 to 20 maximum people to apply for any kind of medical cannabis license uh, as it turned out i think by year two uh, there'd been over 400 applications now, that in itself is a complete mismark from what they were, were assuming would happen, but then it also falls down to the fact that uh, not every license uh, application is of the same quality, yet, um, based on how the process works, they have to assess each one. Um, so even one that has a very poorly executed application from not providing anywhere near enough information around security, for example, still has to go through the resources or the limited resources that they had available to them. So that's some of the key examples that we've seen with others. In terms of actual examples of businesses, probably not ethically right for me to talk about other businesses and 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 what they may or not have done, especially with regards to, to how a licenses are applied and sort of the um, exclude, you know, non-disclosure that you probably have to sign up to in terms of the start of that process. They're trying to, I remember I went to the TGA meeting, they, they're they trying to streamline that process so that it's a little bit easier for, for people to apply and, and it's not so time consuming on their, uh, uh, not the TGA, the ODC meeting. Correct. Um, and it's not so time consuming on their end to uh, to analyze these these applications with all the standing operating procedures and everything behind it. Yeah, and like with anything, um, you know, the more you do a process, the more you refine a process, the easier and auto more automated it becomes. I guess when we got involved in this process um, sort of four years ago and started that process, there wasn't even really a strict guideline or, or information. There was kind of 
a very big templates that you needed to address. But even then, uh, you have what is called a 14J request where they can come back to you and ask further questions and and what have you. And it, it's quite a mammoth process that you need to go through. Um, I think a lot of businesses we've seen as well um, have looked at that thinking we want to get involved in this industry. And even when they start seeing the enormity of, and scale of what they need to be able to do just to apply, um, puts a fair few people off. However, having more 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 staff within the ODC now to help these and them refining their own process on how to make this a little bit more of a, a simple and structured process is, is where we've seen improvements um, from the ODC. I, I've been trying to push this idea as much as possible because I saw in the US, um, I saw the transition from a medical market into a recreational slash medical market in, in Washington state. And I didn't see the industry really take shape till t till tax dollars were created behind the industry to help fund the regulators to then regulate the product. And until they got that money, you didn't really see a well instituted industry. And so um, I don't know how to form that, but um, I know it's very tough on, on, on everybody's part to try to just make get get it all rolling to get started but um i really think that money would it would help drive it in some way and i don't know how to how to actually tax it and not put such a burden on on the the cultivators and the manufacturers that are already having a problem but i'm i'm really trying to push that you need taxes to 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 kind of drive the industry forward but anyway that's a whole different subject um uh any i was you guys were actually kind of starting to roll into New Zealand in some way. Can you tell me about your your uh, how you've entered into New Zealand and, and the, the different models between Australia and, and New Zealand? Yeah, um, sure. I think one of the, the interesting key points, and you probably would have seen our model was similar to that when you first met us at, at uh, Canatec in Sydney. I think initially, uh, and certainly the way we looked at it when we first looked at entering this industry is there was kind of a attitude, and this is global, this was, wasn't just in Australia, that bigger is better, um, you know, there's companies, I don't need to mention the name, I'm sure people within the industry will know, um, that had the, the um, sort of strategy of acquiring as many businesses as possible and looking at that way. That comes with its own pitfalls and is, is difficult to manage. Um, but then I also, think that initially there was sort of a view that it would be best to go with a complete vertical integration end-to-end -end solution. What we have found over time, and sometimes it's potentially, you know, things happen for a reason. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise that our cultivation license was, was a little bit more delayed than our manufacturing license. What we found there is that if you try and do everything from end-to-end, -end, you tend to become a bit of a a generalist and a jack of all trades as opposed to a specialist. And as the industry has grown, um, for example, in, in New Zealand, we have partners. What we've seen is that if you look at the ecosystem of the supply chain, you have research and development, you have manufacturing, you have cultivation. And each of those are specialist areas and trying to be a specialist in every single one of those areas is extremely difficult, if not near impossible. So what we found is, is that throughout our travels, networking, business dealings, um, we found that there's actually the right partners um, available to you to be able to, to tick those, those boxes off and actually create co-ops, if you like. So for New Zealand, for, for example, we are seeing that there's good cultivation coming out of New Zealand and certainly is almost a married match to, to the GACP um, which is the good agricultural practices between Australia and New Zealand are quite similar. So great starting ground for us. With regards to how licenses work, cultivators themselves have to have a commercial agreement with the manufacturer anyway. So it's more become about ma uh, marrying up with the right types of partners within that ecosystem. And as I say, we work, uh, we've got some really good partnerships in New Zealand. Um, there's a really good cultivator that is launching in New Zealand uh, called Orofarm. And um, they really match our values from a business standpoint, ethos, and then their capabilities are, are, are really what we were looking for. So that's where we're starting to see some of those transitions. And then, of course, your brand and product owners, whether they be in Australia or New Zealand, seem to have an appetite 
uh, to supply both of those markets, especially in the in the beginning as they as they build their brands and products up. Um, and so, is there um, how is ha trade being handled between the two countries? Are the are the two countries pretty on point with uh, understanding each other? I mean, they I know in other areas they're very on point, very integrated um, in their governments, but. Uh, in this sector, have you seen them trying to work with one another to try to push the industry forward? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, there seems to be good relations and cooperation, and I think that's always generally existed between Australia and New Zealand, and we don't see it any differently in this industry. Um, as I said to you, um, you know, we're seeing more cultivation than manufacturing coming out of New Zealand at the moment, which is great for Kangia. Uh, uh, that works well within our supply chain and the ecosystem. Um, and I think in conjunction with the manufacturing in Australia, as, as I mentioned to you, both the GMP standards that we have here, um, uh, which are your good manufacturing practices and your GACP standards are very similar, um, which means there is less uh, vetting up front that we need to do because if somebody has managed to get through that license um, application process and then subsequently through their, their actual GMP or GACP permit, um, you're pretty bang on that that both countries will be able to sort of comply in a very uh, well-matched scenario. Um, just one more question kind of on the on the commercial side before I, I jump over to you, Niall, on the uh, kind of the research and development side. Um, how do you see, uh, you're talking about GACP and GMP, how do you see uh, Australia and New Zealand, you know, interweaving themselves in the international market how are they get, how is it going to be competitive on that international scale great question um i think it's the way that it's it's rolling out so we ourselves at, at kangia have already started to to break into more of an international supply um we are working with certain um, institutes and companies in the uk for example uh, and a few other global regions what we've seen it's actually sort of worked the other way around because as the, the compliance levels that i mentioned to you that we have to sort of hit by default what we've actually seen is is uh demand coming from outside of australia and new zealand for supply of certain types of products specifically flour now when we talk about cultivation it's not only to supply flour that will then go through a extraction and manufacturing process for a, for an oil to be uh, formulated into a patient ready product flour itself we've seen a major growth in being a patient ready product um, now well, how i see that expanding into into a global scale if we're talking about countries uh, specific, uh, specifically in the european union um, and the uk for example um, they're looking out for that high quality uh, and consistency it's one thing being able to say hit a 22 percent um thc um level in a plant but it, then it's about how can that 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 quality of that uh flower which is for patient ready use to be you know gmp packaged um how can that consistency um stand there so what we're seeing now from the demand from a global scale is to source suppliers that can provide that stability data um, and, and a stable, steady source of, of the product itself. So with our operations working together in Australia and New Zealand, as those outside demands start coming into, uh, into us more and more, we organically sort of go and meet that demand and supply those markets um, from that standpoint. And as I say, I think um, the governments have done us a good favor by holding us to such high standards uh, allows us to enter pretty much any market in the world because we comply with whatever with whatever their um, compliance standards may be. Gotcha. Um, so Niall, um, you've been working on the research and development, and you said uh, of, across different pharmaceutical drugs and things like that. Can you tell me what you're what you're doing and 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 where you're headed? Certainly can. So. Um, to really talk about why we're doing what we're doing, it's it's important to understand the philosophy that Australia has towards cannabis that differs from the rest of the world. So if you look at exemplar countries like Canada and the US, uh, cannabis is considered a herbal medicine, which really means you have to prove safety, but you don't have to prove efficacy for doctors and pharmacists to recommend and dispense it. 
the Australian government's taken the decision that they're going to treat cannabis to the same standard or hold it to the same standard that it holds all other medicines in that you have to prove not only safety, but you have to prove efficacy for every disease and you have to show that it's comparable to the current drugs we have or better. Um, and that's a big difference that we're seeing. So a lot of what we're, that drives Kenjira at the moment is proving that efficacy to the government so that we can get a product listed on what's called the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods so that doctors can prescribe it. Uh, currently, if a patient wants to access cannabis in Australia, they have to go through what's called an authorised prescriber or go through the SASB process because the medicines aren't actually controlled by the government yet. They're basically unscheduled, unapproved medicines. Uh, so getting the evidence to prove the efficacy of the cannabis is key so that any doctor in Australia can prescribe and any patient can just walk in and say, here's the condition I've got and the doctor can make a clinical distance and say, this will be right for you. You can go to your pharmacy and have it filled in the next half hour. So what we're doing is we're looking at human clinical trial data. So we do have a retrospective study that we've completed recently. We looked at 700 patients who were taking various um, brands of cannabis and looking at how well it treated for chronic pain. And, and we had a particular focus on arthritis. And what we found was um, if you have a CBD, a high CBD concentration that worked very well for chronic pain, but if you had a high THC concentration, it didn't work so well. Uh, we're also doing another retrospective study at the moment looking at anxiety, and we're about to start two human clinical trials. But you look like you wanted to jump in there. I just was wondering, is that what, how is that being administered to the patient? Is that an oil-based form or...? So it's... Uh, uh, several different types of formulations. We're talking flows, which are basically the flowers themselves. There were some oils and there might have been some capsules as well. And this comes on to the next part that I was going to raise in that retrospective studies are fine, but it's very hard to make draw conclusions that will support an ARTG registration when you're not controlling all the different factors. And that's where hu proper human clinical trials come in and be very useful. So, uh, Really, a human clinical trial is trying to show what dose delivered in what way will work for what specific condition. So we're, we're designing our clinical trial now to looking at for some of the side effects of breast cancer chemotherapy. Um, and it's going to be for, for very particular patients. They're going to be taking capsule forms of the drug where we standardise the dose so that we know specifically that type of cannabis works for that type of condition. Um. And tell me the, I guess, the time it takes to conduct these trials and, and what's actually involved. <laughs> yeah. So there's the big problem with, with treating medicines this way, that clinical trials are not a short process. It is, it is years of work. And if you're looking at a, if we weren't talking about cannabis, we were talking about a new drug that someone had invented, like if we're COVID-19, for example. Um, normal clinical trials generally take up to, 10 years to conduct and about half a billion dollars. Now, the beauty of cannabis is we've been using it for a very, very long time recreationally in the world. So we know a lot of the details and we can front end load that into our clinical trials, which means they're a lot shorter. But even now, we're still talking a year or two to get through human clinical trials. So um, there are three phases to a clinical trial. The first phase one is, is it safe? Phase two is, does it work? And phase three is, is it better? Um, we know the phase one, we know that it's safety, right? We know that you can't overdose on cannabis. We know what the short-term and long-term side effects of cannabis use are. So we really, phase one is really not such an issue for us. So it's really about what specific conditions does cannabis work for? And is it work, does it work better than the current treatments that we already have? And, um... Did these clinical trials start to get into, are you looking at the different stra you know, strains of the actual cannabis? Is it sativa versus indica? Is it a particular strain that you're looking at? Um, are you diving into that level of detail? So the strains itself aren't really what's important. It's about what the cannabinoid contents are in the medicine itself. So. You might be expecting to have the regular cannabinoids, the CBD, the THC, but there are some more exotic ones which we 
which evidence is starting to come through that might be more potent and more useful than just CBD. So CBG, CBN, THCA. So where the interest in this particular strains come is only because they can give us a particular profile of cannabinoids in our formulation that we want. But also just as important as the cannabinoids are the terpenes as well. And we're starting to see a lot of evidence that the terpenes that you have in the formulation can affect how the cannabinoids work as well. So the strains, yes, we're interested in the strains, but only to the extent that they can help us control the actual ingredients we have in our cannabis when we're delivering it to the patients. Gotcha. So understanding down to the molecular level, what's in those, what the compounds are in that are being administered to the patient and how they're interacting with the patient. Yeah. And that comes down to Australia considering cannabis to the same, holding it to the same standard as all medicines. So being that, as, as Muddy was saying before, with that standardization on the GMP, that when we say we're delivering you a 2% CBD concentration with 1% THC, every single dose meets that standard. We know exactly what the patient's getting. Just because I come from uh, originally from California and I saw the medical market come in back in, it was 1996, I was in high school, you know, and you saw how much work those guys, you know, put into the industry from the ground up to get it to where it is today, you know, to the real entrepreneurs. But uh, if you go, you went into a medical facility back then, it was, you were looking at the, you know, if you wanted to sleep better, they were looking at the Indicas. And if you, if you wanted more energy, you're looking at the Sativas. Do, does the industry, you know, in these pharmaceutical systems, do they talk to those guys that have been doing it for the last 30 years abroad? They do. They do. And there's certainly a lot of value there in having some of that evidence. The problem is a lot of, a lot of the uh, decisions that are based on those indications on what type of strains you use for what conditions aren't based on robust human clinical trials. It comes from a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, and as we say in science, the plural of anecdote is not data. So uh, what's lacking is the robust phase two, phase three trials to give with certainty that, you know, the particular strain will be useful for that particular condition. And I guess it's just time and money to get those trials done. It's, it's time and money. Exactly. And so, you know, some guys have been working on that heavily. Where do you see that right now? And, and, and where is it heading and, and what's this next step? Yeah. So there are a lot of clinical trials ongoing in Australia. I think from last record, there was maybe 20 or 25 different trials looking at lots of different conditions from Tourette's to the nausea associated with chemotherapy, insomnia, anxiety. I think the, the first company that can get a product to market is really going to change the field a lot. Um, because doctors will be able to do off-label prescribing for different conditions, even if the clinical trial only shows that it's useful for one particular condition. Um, and we're going to see a lot of products, I think, come into the market that will be general cannabis products that they'll have a CBD, THC. But I think the real future here is looking at those more exotic cannabinoids like I was discussing earlier, the CBGs, the THCs, and coming up with the formulations that can deliver the cannabinoids in a better way. So at the moment, the human body, if you if you uh, take cannabis orally, very little of the CBD and THC actually makes it into systemic circulation in the body, very low, what we call low bioavailability. And if you can design new formulations that increase the uptake of the CBD and THC, um, that would be really good. In fact, there's a company we're working with at the moment who are looking at topical CBD, and they're looking at a new formulation that can increase the penetration of the cannabinoids through the skin. And that's where the real future will lie. I've looked at this a, a, a quite a bit is the bioavailability. It's, it's not as bioavailable because it's oil based, correct? That's correct. And the body doesn't want to digest that into the system and it can't pass through, I'm guessing the gut wall no. to get into the into your system. And one of the other things we haven't touched on here is one of the points of clinical trials is you, you see a lot of variability in the bioavailability of cannabis across different ethnic groups and for people with different conditions. So if you're an older person who has very poor liver function or a lot of kidney function, you'll process that cannabis and take it up into your bloodstream different from young people as ourselves who are perfectly fit, you know, maybe in their 20s, 30s or 40s. 
um, and changing ethnic groups. So Southeast Asian is different from African, which is different from white European and how they process it as well. So having clinical trials that show how it works for different ethnic groups and different age groups is important. Because it also breaks down differently if you, let's say you smoke cannabis and then you, you ingest it orally. It's a totally different, it breaks down in the liver when you ingest it, correct? Yeah, so uh, the whole purpose of the liver in humans is to protect the body from toxins. So when you ingest something in your stomach, when it absorbs, the first thing it does is shuttle everything to the liver where the liver tries to break everything down and make it not dangerous. If you inhale cannabis, it has direct access to the bloodstream there and can bypass that metabolism in the liver. So the concentrations and the metabolites you get from the cannabis are completely different when you inhale it compared to if you swallow it. Gotcha. And then obviously it would be different if you were putting on a topical coming and through the skin. If you do a topical, which is why, again, we're going to do these clinical trials because if you smoke it for your condition, or if you ingest it or if you rub it into your skin, you're going to get different results for each of those different formulations for those reasons we've just discussed. And so it's a real race for the all these clinical trials to it, to get their their formulation to market so that they can kind of corner, you know, a certain ailment and then have that drug administered to patients possibly, you know, let's say in Australia or worldwide or wherever they want to do that. Yeah. yeah, there's certainly a first mover benefit here, I think. And I, I might ask Marty to jump in here, given marketing his background, and he knows the importance of being a first mover. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, you, you're spot on, Josh. Um, you know, we, we are working, and I think it's 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 certainly taken us down the right the right path. Um, you know, our core business is we're a B two B business. We're not trying to build our own product or brand and put it on a shelf and fight and market and fight for shelf space. We we are here to facilitate the medical cannabis industry. So, as a B two B manufacturer, wholesaler, and storage and distributor, um, we have brand owners coming to us. So. Exactly what you said there is is the key, and I think there is certainly going to be a massive advantage for those first movers. It's the number of people who have both the money, the capability, and the appetite to go through that process. That's where you find a smaller margin. Um, we're in conversations ourselves, sort of deep level and fairly f far down the line, with one or two of those companies that have the appetite, that have that long-term goal. Um, because it's it's easy to be tempted to say, well, you know, I, I can get a product made by you now, manufactured by Kangia now, uh, stored and distributed, that's scheduled for. And like everybody else, you have to go get a prescription and get it done uh, because that generates revenue now, right? Um, which is fine, and that's, that's a perfectly sound business model. Uh, we've had only one or two that have the capability that are working with us, and we really have on 360 where yes that's our core business but everything we do at Kanjir is with a scientific approach so now we found ourselves with a few of those companies that have the appetite because we have the capabilities especially through through Dr Nile to be able to design the right clinical trial um, produce the right clinical trial and then actually support the whole document um, build data build and then application process so I think while it's a longer term play, the reward for it is certainly um, a much bigger reward because, yeah, um, I think there it's a little bit of a, a first key to the kingdom, if you like, um, that, that applies. You've uh, th I, that brings us back. You talking about you were talking about the vertically integrated guys that were that were going really wide, and you know, I think. Um, what are your thoughts on these big organizations that have you know tried to control? you know, every step in the process and they've raised a lot of money and, and, um, spent a lot of money as well, spent a lot of money <laughs> and just really, I don't see them any further along than some of the small, like smaller guys like yourselves that have, uh, you know, kept it a little bit closer to the chest and, and, and just really haven't, um, extended themselves as much. What's your th overall thought? Process? Yeah. I mean, look, and you know, it, I don't know the the ins and outs of what their internal working so it would you know be non-ethical for me to, to to badge that in any way my opinion on terms of our approach versus what we've seen out there in the market you know if we had a endless um uh 
pots of money essentially to to attack the market and purchase everything up would be great i still don't think we would go down that route the reason being is as i've said what we've looked at in terms of our supply chain i at any given time can look at my database and there's probably 30 to 40 cultivators globally that that, that we've engaged with from you know a, a first meet and greet there is probably a small handful that we have gone into to partnership with and that is due to not only their capabilities now uh, from being a compliant uh, etc it's how they are building their business to scale because you've got to remember uh, just like us as, as as wholesale storage distributor manufacturers we have a business model that scales the supply chain within that needs to be able to scale with us so you find varying limits of capabilities, quality, all sorts of things that come into play. If we look at the, the uh, cultivation components of the supply chain specifically for a moment, there, for example, you're taking a number of things into consideration, not only capabilities and what their, their growing process is like, what is the legislation in the country that they are, they are growing in? What is the climate problems that they have? What are government instability uh, or stability um, uh, variances within those so there are so many key components now to take an approach of just buy everything up globally i feel what you're going to be left with is probably 10 percent of quality and a lot of issues along, along that supply chain which you probably spend more time on either figuring out what to do with or fix than actually focusing on your core business and actually growing and scaling uh, throughout the the ecosystem of that entire supply chain and your co-op of partners if you like and i guess you know you guys are i mean i think australia and new zealand are primarily in that pharmaceutical space what's your outlook on you know there's there's so many other kind of sectors to the industry what's your outlook on the nutraceutical and then the recreational that kind of sit on both sides of that um I mean, in terms of my personal opinion, I think the, the recreational, no, no issue with it. I think it, it's great. Um, it's not the industry I'm involved in. And should it become recreational uh, in Australia, we would still certainly be pursuing what we do on the medical side of that. Um, it brings its own problems, you know, um, because from a, from a commercial standpoint, if, you, if it became recreational and you were a cultivator, for example, you would probably be needing to produce um a very high quality uh product in a very convoluted market for probably less than 30 cents a gram in order to be anywhere in uh, to remain competitive i didn't get into the industry to 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 do that um I, as i say i sort of came from a medical approach i don't see australia and new zealand going recreational anytime uh, certainly within my lifetime of a business career with this with this industry um, simply for the way we've seen it go there's been massive strides over the last four years in terms of its growth and advancement from a medical side but I haven't seen any appetite from from the governing bodies to to go down the recreational route um, where we see the industry going for ourselves um, and Niall might uh, touch on this a little bit more than I, than I will from the beginning, I've also always been interested in, I see a natural transition or inclusion, if you like, of uh, the veterinary space. It's certainly a space that we are spending some time um, working with the right partners, also from a uh, scientific approach and medical approach um, to understand, conduct trials, do the studies to, to provide that, because I think that's a uh, fairly untouched market in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and then further down the, the line from that, we are working with some cosmetic uh, partners for specifically Europe and, and, and Southeast Asia to infuse uh, cannabinoids in those two areas. And I might just let Niall touch on the, the veterinary space because that's certainly a target and a, 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 an interest of ours. Yeah. I might just come back to the, uh, the recreational versus medicinal part first before I touch on the animals. Um, speaking for myself here and not as a CanGIA science director, I'm very against recreational cannabis being approved in Australia and New Zealand. And, in fact, I note that New Zealand had a referendum on it last year and they turned it down. Um, cannabis is no more dangerous than alcohol, but, you know, alcohol is a pretty dangerous drug if you think about it, the amount of societal impact that alcohol has. And I think if we 
put cannabis into the mainstream, I think we start to see a lot of the same types of problems that we have for alcohol into cannabis as well. So cannabis is not without its problems. Um, and the, the risk benefit here, I don't think is on the right ratio. The, the benefits don't out, um, outweigh the risks. So I wouldn't personally be in favor of recreational cannabis in Australia. Uh, Marty pointed out a great point there in that some of our focus now for Kenji is moving away, not just on humans, but moving into the animal space. And if you look at the industries of both New Zealand and Australia, we're very agriculture based and a lot of animals, so sheep, cattle. Um, and if you look at uh, the number of farm animals and domestic household animals compared to humans, the market there is you know, tenfold higher than it is for humans. And there's a lot of untapped need there, you know, chronic pain in animals, anxiety in animals. Um, there's a lot of potential for cannabis to move into the veterinary space. I think even if you look at from just procedures, so uh, Niall mentioned there around the cattle sector, or, or sorry, commercial farming sector is, is probably a better terminology for it. Um, there are certain procedures that they have to do, um, for example, with sheep, um, that they get a lot of pressure from a lot of the animal rights groups like PETA, et cetera, um, in terms of how the, that process is, is applied and that they feel is maybe a little bit uh, inhumane in terms of it could be done better. So again, we always bring it back to science. We're working with a partner at the moment that is a specialist R&D um, around um, derma and absorption, et cetera. So we are, are going in with the view that that technology from an application process might be able to assist in that area, uh, particularly with, with how it's applied in a huma humane way without any cutting of skin or, or any damage to, to, to the animal itself. Um, and if you think, if you look at, if you think that we are probably 10 or 15 years at least behind in terms of human studies of where we would like evidence and clinical trials to be, add another 20 years for animals. Um, so, yeah, for us, we think it's an important, important sector to be concentrating on while doing our core business of, of, of what we started out to do um, sort of four or five years ago. I think that's uh, I think that's a great plan. Um, I don't think as many people are are focused on that that sector. So um, I know there's a couple guys I've talked to in Australia that are that are looking at it. Um, I also think uh, I know that I believe China. I talked with someone in China. Uh, you can do um, uh, I think topicals in China. I believe. Yeah, so um, we are actually just in the process now. It's sort of one of the the, uh, the first we, we're supplying into the UK, a few other regions in terms of variants of products, everything from a very pure THC distillate uh, or CBD isolate, for example, all the way through to a patient ready formula. But um, China's one that we, we are in the process of now supplying for, but specifically um, around the cosmetic side of things, as you mentioned, their topical creams, what have you. If you look at the Hong Kong import process um, and what their laws are, um, if it's used as an ingredient not for consumption, so in a cosmetic, etc. Uh, and to be fair, they, they, they have a bit more of a logical approach than some of the, the, the other countries we work within. Um, that they see C they, they see CBD differently than THC. Uh, you know, in Australia, for example, the whole plant is considered one element and it's all treated the same, even though THC has a psychoactive effect versus CBD, which doesn't. So personally, I think they've got some more logical uh, reasoning to it. CBD, they don't see as a dangerous poison, uh, for example, and certainly if it's being applied in, in uh, balms or, or cosmetics, they see it fit for purpose. Um, Niall, uh, I've always been a proponent of natural remedies. I mean, that's kind of why I'm in the industry. I'm 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 anti <laughs> I'm anti pharmaceuticals and uh, you know anti medical system type of a person. You know, I feel like um, you can heal yourself in most ways through natural remedies. And I think that's why I got into this industry. Before, um, before he jumps in, Josh, doctors will always be doctors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm, I'm trying to weave my way in here. But, um, what's your, you know, we, we talked a little bit before we, air, or we just started the recording uh, in terms of what 
pharmaceutical companies are and why they're in business. Can you touch on that? And then in addition, do you see other, once cannabis comes through this, these hurdles, do you think other plants and medicines will start to be implemented, you know, start to talk on, uh, you know, mushrooms and, and psychedelics and all these other things? Huge question. Yeah, Huge. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Great question. Uh, I might address the first premise you had there that natural is always better than synthetic. And the, the example I like to use with my pharmacy students is we talk about a drug. There's the, literally the most toxic compound on the planet is a protein that we, that we get from a bacteria. Um, if you take one and a half grams, so I'm not sure what that is in ounces, but very small amount, one and a half grams, about the size of a Malteser, if you know the chocolate. Enough, there's enough of the protein in one and a half grams to kill half the population of Australia. And this is a completely natural compound. Um, you actually know the name of this protein. Um, it's, well, you know the brand name of it. The protein is called botulinum toxin type A, and its brand name is called Botox. And we inject it into people's foreheads hundreds of times a day. Um, because it's not so much the source of the medicine, whether it's natural or synthetic, it's the dose that makes the poison is the saying that we've got here. Um, and synthetic can be just as good as natural, but natural can be just as dangerous as synthetic, depending on what you're using and how you're using it. Um, but coming back to the premise of, I think there's a great um, future for natural medicines. Certainly, absolutely. We're, we're starting to look more and more and we're starting to build the science and understand the natural medicines to then move them from alternative and complementary medicines into the mainstream. And I, I, one of the fantastic ones you've raised there, you're talking about mushrooms, but there's been a lot of studies now that have started to move into the cannabis space and say, all right, well, let's start considering cannabis as a real proper pharmaceutical is we're saying and asking the same questions of, well, what about all these other psychedelics. And I've seen quite a few studies now for LSD and its treatment in mental health disorders as well. So I think there's a lot of scope for moving a lot of the, what would be considered illegal recreational drugs and finding evidence and moving them into, in potentially into mainstream medicine when we can show that the benefits they might have. I know that the FDA, uh a number a, a few years ago I released 400 different products that they uh you know natural products that you can start to do research on and they're, they're allowing it in the u.s so uh, i would think that there's i, I don't think there's been a, a lot that have made it through like there's only been about two or three or something like that that have made it through the all the the whole process but um there's got to be a lot of pushback from pharmaceuticals i, I would guess you know and a lot of other industries as well we used to talk in the old days that cannabis was a gateway drug. And I like to think of it now as a gateway drug in that it's opened up the minds of medical doctors and scientists to now consider other recreational drugs for their medical applications. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think there's a lot, it's an it's a interesting drug that in the fact that there's a want from, from the public, from the consumers to, to look at it. You know, it's not just a push from them there's a there's a demand on the other end i think what we, what we're seeing is is there are it's, it's being able to attach a specific element or condition and then knowing that there is a potential substance or chemical or natural compound out there that that can help people right and um you know we live in in, a, 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 in an age where information is at a fingertip and uh, but all we're lacking is, as you say, there is the research and the, 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 the clinical trials and all the evidence to back these up. Um, you know, if we look at, you know, what we're seeing with depression and uh, psilobin or the, the chemical in magic mushrooms, you know, and if you have somebody who's, su who's suffered with that kind of ailment, which is very serious and, you know, depression itself and mental health has only become more apparent and more well known in the last sort of decade. Uh, probably even the last five years, really more than the last decade. So now when we can attach a identified condition that really does need help um, and somebody who's maybe been on um, a certain pharmaceutical, which is now over time not 
built up a tolerance or is actually creating worse side effects and the patient starts demanding, that's where we, we start seeing the appetite, um, I think, to, to be able to push the research and the studies to, to bring some of these natural um, products out uh, that are there. Um, my father, great example, you know, he's, he's had two knee, re uh, knee replacements and unfortunately the last surgery was botched. He now essentially on a bad day uh, has no circulation in the bottom of his legs. On a bad day, he feels like he's walking on glass. Um, he was taking up to 33 tablets a day, essentially addicted to heroin. And um, when I started this business, you know, back in the day, he's a traditional football watching, hardworking, middle class Englishman. You know, cannabis was, I think his word for it back in the day was wacky backy, he used to call it. Um, whereas once he understood that this is just another, you know, if it's approached in the right manner with the science behind it, uh, to the point where I actually introduced him to a physician in the UK, he has now started taking CBD himself. He has seen massive improvements because, again, all of those those opio um, opioids he was taking, he built up a tolerance, a dependence, um, was, wasn't working as well for him. What we've seen now over a, a longer period of having CBD administered is not only is it giving him a better quality of life and helping him, I mean, he said his sleep has never been as well, uh, he's never had sleep as well as he has, uh, which is just one of the benefits, but he's also been able to reduce his opioid intake without having drastic side effects or, or, or effects to his body. So, you know, if it's improving people's quality of lifestyle, but again, I think what Niall said, there is a great, great way of putting it, you know, when, we, when there was no understanding and a, a bit of a scare tactic, I think, uh, you, calling it a gateway, I think what cannabis has come is a gateway to the scientific world to to understand natural natural products and solutions that 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 exist out there. Yeah, I've heard you know uh, countless and countless uh, stories of it it being beneficial to people's lives. So um, anyway, um, thank you to for coming on today. I really that brings us right on about an hour. Um, I've taken the time. To uh, to kind of just talk to people, and it's mostly in the industry professionals that you're talking to. Um, so I really appreciate your time, Martin. And thank and you for Niall. having us. And um, if you need anything at my end, pl please feel free to reach out. Thank Look you. Very much. Thank you very much, Josh. Appreciate it.